Sports are really important vehicles for relationships. We have purpose. We have a why. We bring people together. We connect. I feel like God is our greatest supporter and our greatest coach. It's Rabbi Erez Sherman and Rabbi on the Sidelines. This morning, we are joined by an extremely special guest from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, the CEO of the Philadelphia 76ers and the New Jersey Devils. But Rabbi on the Sidelines, the intersection of sports and faith, we'll learn this morning, truly a man of faith. Scott O'Neill joins us live from Philadelphia. Good morning, Scott. Thanks for joining us. Good morning. I'm so uh, happy to be here with you. Appreciate the work you do. And... Um, Boy, faith is such plays such an important part in my life. It plays such an important role in sports. And we have this, if there's one thing we learned during the pandemic, is that we have purpose. Uh, we have a why. We bring people together. We connect. Not unlike you do in a congregation or a church. It's very similar. We get to escape. We get to feel and see and cheer and dance and high five perfect strangers and hug <laughs> new friends. And feel the joy and elation of winning and the despair and the disappointment of losing and all that connectedness of community that we've been missing for so long during the pandemic. So I, I feel blessed to be here. I appreciate you and the work you do. Well, it looks like you've answered all our questions, so we're going to wrap this up. Ah, uh, ah. <laughs> usually it takes about 45 minutes for somebody in sports to get to that faith topic. And the fact that you literally jumped into that, I think, was a really important point, Right head of Madison Square Garden for many years, growing up in New York, now the CEO of the Philadelphia 76ers and, you know, trust in the process and the New Jersey Devils. But on a day-to-day -day basis, take us into the faith aspect within the actual sports environment, both in the office and I actually would say in the locker rooms as well. What does that look like that we don't see? Well, I mean, I, I, I can tell you about my, my personal practice. Is I, I wake up in the morning, I, I read scriptures, uh, get on my knees and pray, and then get on a Peloton bike and sweat. So I, I think, uh, you know, uh, my my wife is uh, brings an incredible spirit into the into our home, and uh, and for us, we we do uh, daily scripture reading together. We have what we call family home evening in our in our faith, where you know once a week we we talk about an issue in faith. And I think uh, when you bring that to work, um, it's oftentimes complicated. Um, so I, I use the term soul. When I'm talking nice. to work. So I say, do something for your mind, something for your body, and something for your soul every day. Yes, yes. And, um, and, I, and I often say, I oftentimes start by saying, you know, hey, I, I read scriptures, I pray, I, I go to church, but I know that doesn't work for everyone, and that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, but, I, but I do believe that there is stillness we all need to find in our lives. And, and you can find that through meditation and yoga and going for a walk in the woods and being one with nature. And there are a whole bunch of ways you can find it. Um, but, but for me, um, having the blessing of an eternal perspective has changed the way that I, I see the world. It changed the way I manage. It changed the way I parent. Um, in terms of, of faith in the locker room and faith in, in the office, um, you know, you, I mean, how many players have you seen walk off the court and say, praise to God, mm -hmm. um, praise the Lord. You know, I, 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 I didn't understand that when I was young. Mm -hmm. uh, I understand a lot more now. Um, and I, I think that if, if you have the humility to, to give thanks and appreciation for the blessings you have in your life, and you have the humility to understand that the God-given talents you have are not all yours, um, and that we have this opportunity and obligation to share and pay it forward, that's, that's when life starts. So you mentioned prayer in many different avenues right now. Um, I was praying a lot the other night as an L.A. rabbi with that uh, – Clippers ending as the Phoenix Suns dunked over us, but the prayers were working last night as opposed to a couple nights ago. Um, but you said that, right? An eternal perspective. So look, we're in this moment right now that the Sixers were just eliminated. And then what does that look like in the eternal perspective, knowing that that was a deep disappointment, obviously for the fans, but also for you as an individual. But then how do you take that and say, you know, there is a bigger picture here that we can work towards? Yeah, I got to tell you, like, I, I got this, I'll, I'll probably get choked up reading this, but um, my daughter's left me notes in my office after the game. Wow. And um, I don't know if I'll be able to get through this, but I'm going to read, I'm going to read one of them to you. It says, uh, it says, Dad, it'll hurt for a little bit, but you're a beast and a fighter. Hmm. 
an incredible example of grit and drive, a force for good, the most incredible guy on this planet. Keep making your mark. The world will be better because you're in it. And then she added, be where your feet are. Hmm. And I love you, Kira. And um, I just, excuse me for getting emotional. Um, but uh, sports, man, sports is special. You know, my, <laughs> my uh, older daughter, she she works for the Utah Jazz. And she was telling oh, wow. me yeah, they were going to win the championship. And I was like, no, you're not. We are. <laughs> He's like, no, Dad, I'm telling you. Like, I watched this team. Like, we're really good. You know, Donovan, McM um, Donovan Mitchell, yeah. Rudy Gobert, like, they're, this is an elite team. They can score from so many different weapons. Just give me the whole reason why they're going to win a championship. And then they lost. And she called me. She just bro broke down in tears. They lost it the day before we did. And um, got, in 25 minutes, she was crying. I said, hon, um, you have to figure out if this is what you want. She's a young kid, 21 years old. Mm -hmm. I said, uh, I chose this. Like, I, I love this part. I, it doesn't mean I love the wins. I mean, the losses. I love winning. I have a competitive problem. But I love the energy. I love the passion. I love the up and down. I love the thrill. And if you don't love that, that's what I told her, then turn around, run for cover, and never look back. Mm -hmm. But if you feel it, if you love that feeling, not love being sad, but love that that is in the consideration set, uh, this is going to be a business for you. So let's go into the world that you got into by writing this amazing book be where your feet are by scott o'neill when i opened it up i thought it was going to be like lots of other sports books that i read right failure and achievement mm -hmm. but you started with a letter that you wrote to your daughter walking through the forest basically saying wmi i gave a little sermon about this a couple of weeks ago awesome said, wmi what's that i said what's most important and for you, you said one word three times, family, family, family. How do you do that? You're running a two professional sports teams at the highest level yeah. and you're trying to establish a family at the same time at the highest level. You just told me you read scriptures, you speak about what's going on in the world. WMI, how do you put that into your life? Well, I mean, we talked about the perspective. We didn't really hit on it. I, I will say it's like you lose these games and then you go back eight years from when I started, and this team was an afterthought of fiascos. We're last in the league in every business metric. We, you know, two first round picks in the next five years. We hadn't won 50 games since 2001 when Iverson went to the championship. Mm -hmm. um, and now we're first in the East and at the top of the KPIs of every metric. And so, you know, and the question is, is like in that eight year journey, what did I learn and did I live the way I want to live? And, um, and I think a tool like WMI, what's most important, just makes, gives it a framework. And so the way I think about it is, what's most important at work? What's most important for me? We can talk about like how you have to take care of yourself too, because everybody's taking care of everybody. You know how it is, you grow up and we were taught serve others. That's, mm -hmm. that's how, you know, so I, I grow up thinking, um, you know, nobody goes up and says, take care of yourself. You know, yeah. make sure you're good. But the reality is you take care of yourself first, then your family, and however you define family, and then you, then you can do your job. Um, so so for, for me, um, if you go through that exercise and write down those nine things, what's most important for you personally? What's most important for the relationships? What are the key relationships that matter most to you? What's most important for your work? And then you audit your calendar and you get a humbling reality. Mm -hmm. Because when you take your calendar and you say, okay, I'm going to take every – one of my pink spots on my calendar, and I'm going to map them to those nine things. I'm going to have another category. When I first did it, 23% of my time was spent on what I am claiming to be most important. Think about that. 23% of my waking hours. That's like, so I either have to change what I think is most important or change the way I schedule my calendar. Mm -hmm. And I, I chose to do the latter, fortunately, because I think the things that matter most, um, you need to... Are, are are generally evergreen, generally evergreen. Mm -hmm. You know, some relationships may come and go, your work may evolve a little bit, but you, um, but, I, but I think generally we have to do a better job of making sure that one, we are intentional about where we're spending our time. And, and two, that 
we have the discipline to say no. And that we, three, that we understand that life's about trade-offs. So when you talk about family, that's a long answer to a short question. No, it's but great. When you talk about family, that is my WMI. So I am 100% figuring out how to make sure that the time I have creates moments and memories because it's not about balance or, you know, this notion of balance is, it's, it's, it's nonsensical, you know, <laughs> because, well, it doesn't reflect reality because at my house, I've got three teenage daughters. They're all little, there's a lot of energy in the house. Um, and if you think you're going to have a meaningful moment getting them out of the house for school, then you don't have daughters because mm -hmm. it is NCAA tournament survive in advance time. Just get them out alive. <laughs> Just try to get out without a nuclear meltdown. We get them out. They're in school. They've got cheerleading. They've got basketball. They've got homework. Some of them have boyfriends, which I don't want to talk about. And then I'm at work, and we come home, and it's like, okay, am I flipping on another office rerun or another Seinfeld rerun? Or am I scrolling through trying to do my, my email again because I'm backed up my email? Am I taking calls? Or am I trying to take advantage of that 45-minute or one-hour yeah. window? Mm -hmm. and that's what you have. And once you recognize that you have an hour a day, I wonder how you might think about it differently or act differently or approach that time differently. During, during the pandemic, you know, I rediscovered the family, um, family dinner, which is wonderful. By the way, yes. that's amazing. Yes. <laughs> and uh, it's been 25 years, so it's good that I introduced myself to them. But when I <laughs> started, I, I bought like conversation starter cards, which sounds so almost embarrassing to tell you, right? Yeah. Um, I have mine right here. We're all good. Oh, good. Good for you. Yep. Right. Feather, right? <laughs> so... But it was, for me, it was, it just started. What's your favorite vacation and why? If you could have any dessert, where would it go? Where would you go if you go anywhere in the world? What do you want to be when you go? All this stuff. And then and you didn't need them the whole time, but just starting off to talk about something like, how was school? Good. Yeah, right. Learn. Nothing. Nothing. Can I just go to my room and get on my phone? No, you can't. Uh-huh. Phones in the house. Anyway, we have some draconian rules around phones. It's like, be where your feet are. Phone down, head up. Phone down, head up. Just think about it. Like, think about in your house, restricting phones from the kitchen, mm -hmm. not having them at the kitchen table, having a phone mm -hmm. desk where you check in, taking the phones at night. We have to reconnect with each other. We have to do it at a different level. We really do. And you actually say that even at the workplace, right? I mean, we're yeah, we back in we're we're back in the synagogue for the first time this week, right? Right. And it's really strange to walk outside and see somebody face to face. Like, how do I talk to you again? without the phone. And you explain that in your staff meetings, right? You actually check the phone and say, we're going to be where our feet are. We're going to be face to face. Um, what was yeah. the reaction when you in instituted that at first? You know, the, the Gen Z's and the millennials have a real issue. Um, the, the <laughs> people my, I'm 51 years old. People my age are like, uh, another one of Scott's rules, you know? So I, um, they know how passionate I am about people. Um, they know that I love them. And I know that's not a word people use in the office. I do. Mm -hmm. I even say to my team, it's like, you, you don't have to like each other, but you have to love each other. Ooh, I love that. Yeah, so so you come in, you know, and, and the, the when they're new, the Gen Z's and millennials are like, what am I supposed to write with a pen? I'm like, I know it's crazy, right? Yeah. <laughs> you can do it. Um, and I, I see them quite a bit. But, but the reality is, is that we need to, I mean, you talked about walking outside. How about before your service starts? Like, that's what we need. Mm -hmm. How are you doing? Oh, how's your son? Oh, how was the game last night? Oh, your daughter scored the winning goal. Oh, I understand you started a new job. That's what we're missing. Mm -hmm. The world's turned into like a big elevator where we just stare down on our shoes and don't say anything anymore. Right. And we have this opportunity to just reconnect. And by the way, if you're feeling good and you're feeling strong, you look very positive, you look like you're connected, you have light in your eyes, I think that's wonderful. But when you do, that's when you got to reach out. You have to look at the Zooms and say, oh man, Sally has not come on this Zoom. She hasn't put her photo on the Zoom and the video on. For two weeks, I better check in with her. Mm -hmm. um, hey, um, Joan's uh, voicemail box is full. You know, I might want to step by her place. Um, hey, you know what? Someone just popped in my head. Why don't I send him a text? You know, like we have to, when we're feeling good and we're feeling strong and we're feeling alive, we got to reach out because, you know, and you know what? When you're not feeling good, just raise your hand. Can I get some yep. help over here? So you, you mentioned the word positive and another acronym that you bring up in your book is API, which I absolutely love. I've been using that the last couple of weeks. Great. Assume positive intent, right? That often we go into like this, yes. but no, it's like this. No, palms and, uh, up. be palms up. Yeah. How are you able to change that culture within the 76ers organization of the API? And what did that look like during that yeah. turnaround? You know, I, I would say, you know how I jump back from home to work and work to home? Uh -huh. I use the same language 
you know, I lose the same language at church as I do at home as I at work. And so, uh, so my daughters have heard API for 15 years. You know, nice. I've only worked at this one organization for eight, so they've heard it for eight years. Uh -huh. And um, and if you ever have, if you have teenage daughters, you know what what uh, what API does not look like, and that's how teenage daughters deal with their moms. Um, and so, so it's, I have a nine year old, so I can't wait. Oh, th three or four years, give me a buzz. I'll, I'll, I'll call you back for it's sure. Wonderful, wonderful experience. Um, but I I I think that um, the ba way I explain API, you did it amazingly well, is that you come in palms up, you're empty headed. There is nothing that's clouding the judgment of this conversation. It's not the conversation we had yesterday or something you said or did to me a week ago. I'm not reading into your text. I'm mm -hmm. not reading into your, your email. I'm, I'm assuming positive intent that what you sent me comes from the purest place, place of love and that your intention is pure. I'm walking into conversations empty headed, ready to learn, ready to engage, open to understand, open to love. The world gets better. Work gets better. Mm -hmm. Your interactions get better. Your relationships get better. It's like, you know, when you get in those situations with, with your wife or, or your partner or your uh, husband and uh, something happened. You, you're having a bad day and, and um, your wife comes in and says something and, and all of a sudden you're, you, you've, you've risen to another level. All she said was, how was your day? <laughs> but you heard, how was your day? You're like, no, no, no. She didn't say, how was your day? She said, how was your day? Honey, are you okay? Why does it always have to be about me? I don't know. I'm just telling you I love you, and I'm just checking in on you. Uh -huh. um, and so that, that, those are just like some temperature checks that you have to just understand where you, how you're feeling and where you're coming from. And if you assume that, that people are rooting for you, and you know, I, I come from a core place that I believe people are good. Mm -hmm. I believe mm -hmm. people come from love, and I believe people root for you, and they're, they're trying to help you. And, and if you come from that place, life gets a lot easier. Scott O'Neill, be where your feet are. So you mentioned a lot about ourselves, how to take care of ourselves, but often we learn about ourselves from others and their experiences. And within this book, you mentioned several different people that you have learned very powerful lessons. One of them being uh, 76ers executive Dave Schaller. And you mentioned that his father was in a, basically a, a, a homeless shelter, if you wish. Yeah. And when he went to go see his father, he saw an entire family there. And at that moment, he realizes the gratitude that he had as his own life. Take us through, like, how do you learn that story from a guy like Dave? And then what do you take from the lesson that he has taught you? Oh, man, is that just, a, is that one of the most powerful stories? That was, that was intense. <laughs> yeah. So, so we have, and, and, and annually, we bring our executives, our top 100 executives offsite. Um, and we call it a go forward. Go forward. Yes. I also use that. I told our team here, no more retreats. No it's more go retreats. Forward. I love that. Okay, good, 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 good. So, so yeah, so at our go forward, we, we typically invite our, our rising stars to facilitate the sessions. We put it on all in-house. Um, I, I'm a, I'm a, you know, my folks were leadership development trainers. So I'm very mm -hmm. passionate about developing the next generation of great leaders. And so I typically work with the pairs. We pair them up in fours or five. And so there are two of them. And so five sessions, and then we build them from scratch together. And then we, talk quite a bit about how to facilitate, how to present, what slides should look like and why, and how you incorporate video and what exercise will drive the home points home. And, and it's a pretty fun two month exercise. And then um, when we get towards the end, we invite them to share a story that mm. they may have not have shared before um, mm. that can make them vulnerable um, to uh, drive home the point of what they're trying to teach but to also um, let everyone in the organization know that it's okay. It's going to be okay. And, and Dave's story is, is a beautiful story. He grew up in a trailer park and pissed that he's one of four. He's the oldest. He's 10 years old. He's got to go pick his dad up who's an addict. And he's at the shelter and, and he sees this woman in it with a blue duffel bag. And that's mm -hmm. the perspective for him. It's like, Take a breath, Dave. Mm -hmm. he, all he's thinking is, I got a mom who's struggling. I've got a dad who's an addict who keeps going to these shelters. I've got three younger siblings who I'm responsible for at 10, 10 years old. Mm -hmm. And right there at that point, he has perspective. It's like, okay, it, it's, it's bad, um, but it's going to be okay. And because uh, this woman with these three kids at this shelter, she had nowhere to go. That was, she was checking into home. He got to go home. 
And I think we all need that, right? Because we're all in the eye of our own storm. And, and for my 14 year old daughter, it's when her friends are making a TikTok video at some party that she's not invited to. That to mm -hmm. hers, you know, mm -hmm. ah, or my daughter crashes her car. My daughters are the worst drivers in the history <laughs> of mankind. And I will tell you that your insurance company will cancel your insurance if, you drive, if your daughters drive like mine and they have. <laughs> um, but for her, crashing her car, the only thing you care about is a dad, is she okay? That's it. Right. I mean, that's right. period, stop, end of sentence. But for her, that was, was devastating. You know, for my older one, it's when the jazz lose. For my wife, it's when, you know, I mean, we all have these things that we're just in the eye of our own storm. We've got to pull that lens back um, and just see that it's, it's going to be okay. And I, I think that for me with perspective, that was the big lesson that, that Dave shared with us. So that's one perspective. And to, I guess to take it a step further, when your good friend took his own life and realizing that perhaps somebody could have either reached out before, um, maybe you can just take us through that journey yeah. and uh, how we can, men mental health is an extremely important piece, especially through COVID here at Sinai Temple. We're in fact just beginning a mental health initiative. It's something that's really not spoken about so much in the faith world. And I know in the sports world as well, I have a good friend, a former NBA player who after his dad passed, um, went through a depression and he said, I couldn't speak about it then. I believe it's a little different now. What does mental health look like in the sports world right now? Yeah, it's not great. Uh, it's, uh, I don't think it's just the sports world. I think it's everywhere. It's in my house. Right. It's on, in our locker rooms. It's in our offices. Um, mm -hmm. And my formula is, for myself is relatively simple and something I espouse to, to my, my, my team is do something for your mind, something for your body, and something for your soul every day. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. get some sleep, practice gratitude, and put your phone down, get your head up, be where your feet are. So that's, mm -hmm. that's six points, and, and we need to be learning and growing and stretching our minds every day. We need to get our, our heart rate going 20 minutes a day in terms of your body. Your soul, you've got to pray. You've got, you've got to do something. You've got to read scriptures. Get on your knees. And if not, meditate. It's okay. Like, find some stillness. Like, look up. Look up. And then sleep. When I was growing up, it was... Sleep is for the weak. You know, I heard that a hundred times. Money <laughs> sleeps, all this crap. It doesn't, it doesn't, it's not right. Your body, your mind, your soul, we all need rest. Sleep experts we brought in told us six and a half to eight and a half hours a day. No, no. Mm -hmm. um, and then the gratitude part, you know, I have this great sign in my house. My wife put it up in our kitchen. It says, it's not happy people who are, who are grateful. It's grateful people who are happy. Love it. Not happy Can you repeat, repeat that one more time? Yeah. It's not happy people who are grateful. It's grateful people who are happy. Mm -hmm. So our ability to express thanks and gratitude. Oftentimes when I speak to corporate groups, I just have them send a text to their mom. Mm -hmm. Tell your mom that you love her, one thing you learned from her, and one thing you appreciate about her. And the note I got back when I did it the first time myself was, "Hun, are you okay? <laughs> it's like, ah! It's like I have to be better and do better. And we have this incredible opportunity just to reach out. And it's like 60 seconds a day, you spent a note of a text of gratitude to one person a day, the world's better. Mm -hmm. um, and it helps you. It helps the sender as much as it helps the receiver. And then phone down, head up. That's be where you're that's the, that, that's the simplest one. You do those six things, you're, you're, I think your mental health is better. For me, when my friend uh, Will Carter took his own life, um, you know, he was the one who baptized me. Um, oh, wow. To my faith. And I uh, met at Harvard Business School. Um, my, my, my kids called him Uncle Will. So he was, he was part of the family for sure. And I'm speaking at his funeral and I'm looking out and I, right. I kept thinking about those five kids and will they ever get a story from him? No. Will they ever hear another lesson from him? No. You know, um, and I wanted to not only share his story, but share my own journey, um, share my, my disappointment myself, you know, and I talked to him a couple weeks earlier and I just didn't get, I didn't understand mental health. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like taboo. Like we have to get it out of the closet and into the light. And we need to be okay raising our hands. And by the way, NBA players have been great at sharing stories. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Kevin Love was the first one to say, hey, I'm having mental health issues. Good for him. You know, right. um, it allows uh, the other younger players to see that and, and, and speak out and reach out. So it's, so it's okay to talk about so you can get help. Mm -hmm. It's like my friend, I was like, hey, just be happy. Serve others. I'm like, I look back at the stuff I told him. I'm like, what the heck? Mm -hmm. uh, I actually had uh, Coach Phil Martelli on a couple of months ago and we were speaking about Delonte West and how he said, I don't care what he's going through. He's my son. 
Uh, and uh, he was also, I mean, Martelli was amazing and really was wonderful, wonderful choking coach. up wonderful and saying, man. when a coach becomes a coach, a real coach of a player, you really become a father to another child as well. And yeah. uh, I absolutely have seen that. You also mentioned in the book something about uh, the racial issues going on in this country. And you tell the story of Elton Brand, who also works with you, who's just an amazing basketball player, but also executive and, and person as well. And you realize from his comments of what perhaps he has gone through as a black man in this country, something that you and I have never gone through. Um, take us through that perhaps eye-opening experience and then um, how, and I've asked many people this over these last couple of months on this podcast, what is the significance of sports within societal change? Because I'm hearing two answers as I talk to people every week. One is, as you said earlier, sports is an escape that we can high five strangers. Don't talk about the problems of the world. And the other answer I hear is this is the exact place that the problems of the world can be um, highlighted and in fact, make a significant change. How would you see that within the sports world in general and maybe some of the changes that you have seen or been part of? Yeah, I'll start with Elton Brand and come around. Um, but with the death of George Floyd, um, I think we were all challenging our notion of what is right, what should be, what could be, um, what is, what do we really know? What, what, what we're all questioning. And by the way, why was it, why did it wait for George Floyd? Anyway, it's mm -hmm. another day. but anyway, we had this platform and, and I walked into an organization that was 95% white men. And if it were that organization, um, upon the death of George Floyd, I think it would have been a really different experience. And, and, and fortunately now, got 34% of my um, team across HBSC are black and brown. Um, and it's wonderful. And, and I had one woman who was a VP and now I have 18 women who are VPs or above. And so, so we have a very diverse organization, which gets you to the starting line. Mm -hmm. um, and, and Elton Brand shares the story. He was our general manager, played in the league, number one overall pick out of Duke. Yep. And uh, just a wonderful soul. Um, and him and, and Doc Rivers, who's an African-American coach, they are incredible human beings, uh, world-class leaders, and incredible advocates for social change. So to have two amazing leaders and a diverse organization at a time where we were all on our heels a little bit, trying to figure out what to do and how to do it. And we opened up, we had three 90-minute Zooms, uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and and um, and it effectively, it was an open mic night. Wow! If you experienced racism, that was the that was the session. And we planned on having one for sixty minutes, but ended up having three for ninety minutes. I I'd be honest with you, I, I cried through through most of them. Hmm. Um. And Elton, you know, is one of the most five recognizable people in Philadelphia. I'd imagine. Um. He's uh, you know, general manager of an NBA team and. And a big time star. Anyway, so he trips an alarm alarm in his house, and he says to his wife Seneca, "Like, hey, you, you got to get the door. The cops are coming. I can hear the sirens." She's like, "Why do I have to do it? Like, you do it. You trip the alarm." And he says, "Seneca, they see a six foot eight black man coming out of the house in this neighborhood. I'll be on the pavement with my my hands cupped on my back." And I thought, "Holy wow. crap!" Mm -hmm. um, and then a friend of mine told the story. His name is Desron Dorset, uh, and he said. He said, I've been pulled over 53 times in three years. And I was like, he's like, now I speed, which I thought was the funniest, yeah. cutest way to do it. But that wasn't the point of the story. He said, he looks in the camera and he points at me and he says, Scott, has any police officer ever asked you if it was your car that you were driving? Mm -hmm. And so I had these moments. And by the way, it was 90 minutes, three days in a row. It was heavy. So I am literally like, as someone who who has created diverse organizations, who grew up in a diverse neighborhood, is very comfortable um, in all kinds of situations, I start thinking, like, do I know enough? The answer is no, by the way. You know, mm -hmm. so none of us do. I know. It's like we have to be better and do better. So I started reading and studying. I'm watching Just Mercy. I'm reading White Fragility, the book. I'm reading a Harvard case on, um, you know, systematic racism, which I didn't really even understand about housing and redistricting and banks and the criminal justice system and Jim Crow laws and all this stuff. Like, I don't want to say like, I didn't know, I just didn't know enough. Um, mm -hmm. And, um, and I got smarter and, and, uh, and we started making driving change in the organization. And uh, I remember like, you know, we, we had this really cool buy black program 
where we we sponsor five um, black owned businesses in Philadelphia and five black owned businesses in Newark. Wow. And we we give them free sponsorships and mentor them. It's, it's awesome. And then we that just started at the yeah, yeah, last eighteen months. After, yeah. Wow. And then, we, and then we did an audit of our vendor spend, which was painfully white, and we had to make some changes. And we set benchmarks and targets and changed the the rules and regs coming in. And we invested in a cool cool housing property in, in a tough area of Philadelphia, Strawberry Mansion. And um, and then we had this big grand program uh, where we were going to put, put a we we're gonna it was a RFP to build um, an arena and um, supporting development at the waterfront. It's gonna be four and a half billion dollars. A billion dollars was gonna be spent in the black um, African American community. And we lost the bid. And I'm like, how did we lose this bid? But anyway, we'll find another one and we'll figure it out. But, I, but um, so we commit commit $20 million um, also to to causes in the space. And we're, we're like, we're in the game. We, you know, I, I work with wonderful people, Josh Harris and David Blitzer. And um, and they have a, a full commitment to driving change in the world. And, you know, if, if nothing else, um, we're doing our part. And is it enough, by the way? No, it's not. Can we do more? Of course we can. Are we in the game? We are in the game. We are well, actually, that's important that you say that there's a rabbinic saying that says in Hebrew, Lo alecha ham lecha li more, that, um, that you cannot desist from the work, basically, but you at least got to start it. Yeah. And it's like really important. It's like you said, to be in the game, both physically and uh, spiritually as well. Uh, I want to go back to New York for a second. Uh, of course, you grew up there, um, but you reached the pinnacle of New York sports. I might have passed you in the hallways. I never missed a uh, Big East tournament from 2000 to 2009, okay. studying at Columbia and the Jewish Theological Seminary, awesome. a Syrac- Syracuse guy. So those are amazing years of Jerry McNamara um, just uh, lighting up How the garden. About, wow. Yeah, he was fun. <laughs> Yeah, there's only only one time a year I would play hooky from rabbinical school. It was the Big East tournament. So, uh, thanks for opening up your doors to me. Um, but I remember somebody said, "How long are you going to be here?" And you said, "Forever." And they literally laughed in your face. Yeah. Right. And you talked earlier in our uh, podcast about the word eternal. And here you thought yeah, that job was going to be eternal, um, but it definitely was not. So, what did you learn as you and? Uh, you often say that you learn a lot from failure and you say, just as you go forward, you also fail forward. Um, What was that moment when you realized this wasn't eternal and that I'm going to take a break here and then move on to the next eternal perspective? Yeah. The the biggest lesson I learned from Madison Square Garden and uh, and being fired. First of all, no one says they were fired ever. They're like, I left. I'm like, I didn't leave. I mean, I left for sure. That's true. I did leave. Um, They asked me to leave. You know, I I always tell people when they tell me they left, I'm like, but did you get a severance? That means you were fired. But anyway, regardless. Um, So I was fired. And um, my biggest takeaway was I was so focused on being right. And I have to focus more energy on being effective. Mm -hmm. And um, and, and what's, what's hard is, you know, Sometimes I was right, but it doesn't matter. You know, there are so many different constituents, so many different people and so many different opportunities that we have this, this chance to like step back and just look at the, at what is happening and, and who's in our life and who's in the game and who, and how we can be more effective, I think is much better spent energy. When I actually left, I got great advice. Peter Gruber was the guy who gave me the advice. He's um, Mandalay entertainment and uh the warriors and dodgers and lafc and a bunch of other things he's just a brilliant brilliant sage and um he said decompress mm-hmm. he's like don't let your type a crazy take over i was like what do you mean <laughs> <laughs> no seriously what do you mean um i knew what he meant um and he's like you know you're gonna want to try to prove everybody wrong and um that you're smarter or better you get a job in two weeks and you're you know he's like go away take lisa away mm-hmm. I was like, okay so i took my wife to cabo which was awesome and um and i don't need to be disrespectful because not everybody can go to cabo like right i i, I get the drill like when i when my um was last out of work i was out of work out of luck out of money i didn't have any severance i ran a company to the ground i literally was getting foreclosure notices on my house so i, I understand like the other side of it so i, I don't mean to make light of that mm-hmm. um but at this particular time I, I didn't have those issues i didn't have any financial problems were challenging and um and i took my kids out of school and went to London and Paris. We got, right. we got literally um, hooky notices from a uh, state of Connecticut. <laughs> and I sent some funny notes back. My wife had to clean up when we got back, but I was like, yeah, she's at the Louvre right now. You need coloring. I mean, what's she going to do in kindergarten? Like, you're seriously sending me a note for this? 
<laughs> um, but my wife did not think that was funny, nor did the state of Connecticut. But anyway, um, I learned to decompress. I learned to read and study and think. And then, um, you know, it's amazing if you actually take time and write what you want to accomplish. I think, you know, Andy Warhol said, I think he said 15 minutes of fame. I think the world has gone to 15 seconds of fame. Yeah, for sure. And it's like Insta famous, TikTok famous, all this stuff. And we just gotta lengthen that lens. I mean, we have to start thinking, you know, maybe you're not ready to have an eternal perspective, but maybe you think about what you want to accomplish in a year. A friend of mine, um, Henry Johnson runs Northern Trust, said the other day, he said, um, you know, I overestimate what I can do in a day, but I underestimate what I can accomplish in a year. And yeah. Like, That's me too. And, um, <laughs> but, but I don't think a lot of us focus on that because we're on the treadmill and we're running so fast and we're getting ready for whatever's next. And if we take some time to say, okay, here's what I want to accomplish in a year. Here's what I want to accomplish in two years or three years or five years, wherever your window is. And then build a plan and then carve out time and accomplish it. Mm -hmm. And um, and I think that that's that shouldn't be as unique as it is. That's um, true. But I, but I loved my time at MSG. I mean, that that is the world's most famous arena for me. Yes, absolutely. I mean, that is big and grand. And I mean, there's nothing like that place in the world. Yes. And uh, it's it was fun. Fun time. Real fun. Well, I've been to Wells Fargo Center a couple of years ago, and there was nothing like uh, Look, I've been in L.A. 12, 12 years. I've been to Lakers and Clippers games. I know I'm talking to an L.A. audience and the Philly audience as my family's there. But, wow, there's nothing like a game in the Wells Fargo Center when uh, those guys oh, come around out of the locker room. Oh, those oh my our fans gosh. are as passionate as you'll find in the world. And they let you have it. One way or the yes. Other. Yes. Yeah, yes. So two more questions to uh, conclude our time today. Be where your feet are, Scott O'Neill, CEO, 76ers, and New Jersey Devils. The question is, where are your feet today? And where do you want your feet to be tomorrow? Where are my feet today? Um, literally in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. Uh -huh. Figuratively, they're right here with you. I um, I spend a lot of time here. I, I was at lunch with my friends the other day, and I just said to them, they're all on their phones. I was like, guys, I haven't seen you in a year. Mm -hmm. A year. And so we should either do this or not. And it's okay if it's not, but life's too short, time's too precious. I mean, time mm -hmm. is our most precious commodity. It really is. If there's one thing we learned in COVID, it's about time and the preciousness of time. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think um, if I want to be somewhere else, I'd sign off. And I hope you do the same. Can you imagine like if you weren't, like this podcast, you're engaged, you're interested, right. you read the book, you have questions, you have preparation, you're with me. Can you imagine if you were in front of your congregation and you weren't with them? Yeah. How could you possibly lead? Mm -hmm. And maybe it's easier to be, uh, you know, you're in a pew and you're and you're more passive and you can pick up your phone and play Candy Crush. I don't, I don't know, but they, <laughs> they do that too. Else. Don't worry, they do that. <laughs> they, should, they should go somewhere else. Like you know, it's like be where your feet are. Like engage. Like appreciate the moments you're in. Live in the moments you're in. You know, there's so many distractions out there. Focus, 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 focus. I want to end with the letter that you wrote to your daughter, Elisa, because it was just extremely powerful. And the fact that you started with the letter that she wrote to you just a couple of days ago during a trying time professionally. And you said, I love you, Elisa. I love you with all my heart and all my soul. I just want to stop there because you keep mentioning heart, soul, and mind. And the scripture that comes to mind for me is something that we say within our tradition from the Old Testament and the Bible um, in the declaration of our faith. Um, you should love your God with all your heart, with all your might, and with all your soul. And that is the message that you write to your daughter. So what is the message of Scott O'Neill, the spiritual self, to us today as we, God willing, open up this world a little more and find where our feet will be? My simple message is uh, love all, judge less, Serve all. Say that one more time for all of us. Love all. Judge less. Serve all. Absolutely. It's amazing. You know, every morning we wake up and in our tradition, we say, that we thank God. And you mentioned the word thank and gratitude many times this morning, that we thank God for restoring our soul that each day is a moment of gratitude. Each day is a moment that we must judge less, love all, and most importantly, uh, serve all as well. We are so honored this morning, afternoon in Philadelphia, I guess uh, mid-morning in the Midwest, and uh, it's five o'clock somewhere. We have Scott <laughs> O'Neill, this Philadelphia 76ers, New Jersey Devils CEO, 
If you haven't picked this up, it is an amazing, amazing gift for yourself and for all, whether you're a lover of sports, whether you're a lover of faith, or whether you're a lover of humanity. Be where your feet are. Scott, it is so great to have you. When you come out here to LA, we would love to have you as a guest here in person at Sinai Temple as well. Thank Bravo, you for your time. Thank you. I appreciate you and all you do. Making the thank world you. better. Thank have you. a great day. You too.